happens with d4. Let's tell him good luck. What to play against d4? I'm feeling in a fianchetto mood, so I'm going to play g6. About an hour ago, I tried to record a crazy house tournament. I jumped into a one-minute crazy house tournament here on League Chess. And I was able to complete the tournament, but I was lagging really bad throughout. But I don't think it was my internet connection. I think it was my computer. At various times, the game just stopped, and my recording was extremely messed up. So I don't know if I can even post it or not. So I'm playing a standard game instead. So those of you who like the standard games, you're in luck. I'm playing this instead of Crazy House. But I will try to play another Crazy House tournament because it was a lot of fun. And Atrophied and uh, another guy, Krosky, one of the better Crazy House players. Uh, the, both those guys were in the mix. So I feel bad that the recording was all messed up. So he's developing really solid with bishop to d3, locking in the dark square bishop, but setting up a nice and compact pawn structure, everything defended. I think I'll just play knight f6, followed by castles. We've got a channel viewer. Nimzo Bros, thank you for watching. Now, my next major decision after castling will be deciding how best to attack his center because I want to chip away at those pawns in the center. And because I haven't committed my committed my E or my D pawns, I can try to play D6 followed by C5, or possibly D6 followed by E5. Those would be the traditional ways to try to take down White's central configuration. Okay, so he's developing in logical fashion, I would say, for this sort of setup. He is leaving open the option of playing F4 and Knight to F3, creating a reverse stonewall. He may do that. I think I'll just play D6 for now. I want to see if he'll play f4 or not. If he plays f4 directly, I might go e5 immediately. Just no preparation. But he could very well play knight f3 or make some other move. If he plays knight f3, I'm considering knight bd7. And then e5. I think I'm liking e5 a bit more if he puts the knight on f3. Because then I can play rook e8 and try to threaten e4, forking the knight and the bishop. I could definitely try to go for c5 though too. It's just a matter of choice. Yeah, and he plays the e5 move. Okay, so here, or sorry, the f4 move. In which case I am thinking about playing e5. Yeah, let's do it. Now, if white were to take twice on e5, not only would he lose the bishop on d3 at the end of the line, my queen would capture, but also his pawn structure would be ruined. If you're playing with this sort of pawn structure, you usually do not want to have to take and mess up the pawns. But then again, if he does nothing, I can capture on either f4 or d4 and maybe throw in rook e8 check. Or just play rook e8 and try to threaten e4 again. Granted, if he plays knight f3, he'll be attacking my pawn on e5 three times with knight in both pawns. But I could defend it again. I could play something like knight c6 or even make one of the captures. Okay, so he's going to take once, and maybe now he'll play knight f3. I do think he needs to speed up his development on the king side and try to get castled. e3 is a weakness, however, already. Yeah, if knight f3, I don't think there's anything stopping me from just taking. And assuming he wants to take with the e-pawn, then rook e8 check will be good. If knight f3, e takes d4, c takes d4, I can play rook e8, and I'll be on the e3-pawn. So I'll be hitting that with tempo. That's annoying for him to have to address this early in the game. So I'm liking my choice of opening in hindsight because he went for this setup. Fianchettoing and leaving the central pawns flexible is really nice against this reverse stone wall. So knight f3. Yeah, I'm liking taking on d4. I'm just thinking if any other move is logical here. Knight c6 comes to mind. Again, we're not afraid if this pawn ever captures due to the hanging bishop on d3, but knight c6, he'll just castle 
and I'm not getting anywhere against the pawn on d4. So I think taking is correct. Let's do that. Give him a mini dilemma about which way to recapture. Knight takes would just lose a piece to c5, along with being pretty unappealing. So he's going to take and allow me this check. I'm not going to think twice about this check. I'm checking with the rook rather than the queen, because I might want my queen flexible to go somewhere else. I think the rook is destined to be on e8. Also, with rook e8, he can't play queen e2, which after queen e7, he could have played that. So this e3 square is sticking out like a sore thumb. I want to try to land my knight on there. But I do have development things to consider, too. So completing my queenside development is not a bad idea. I am happy that I forced White's king to move this early, though. Had he played bishop e2 on the previous move, maybe then I would have played queen e7, and he would have been stuck on the e-file. So moves I'm considering now. Knight d5, pawn c5, knight g4 maybe. Knight d5 and knight g4 are pretty similar, both angling for the e3 square. Knight c6 also. I think if c5, he'll probably play knight b3. Simply trying to develop. Maybe then I play... I could take on d4, try to open lines, but he gets to land a knight there at least. Probably knight b takes d4. Maybe then knight c6, just developing. Yeah, let's rip, rip open some lines. I'm going to go c5. If bishop b5, I'll play bishop d7. Again, I'm playing off the fact that he can't take this right now due to the hanging bishop. That's why I mentioned bishop b5. That might be an attempt to attack my rook and enable him to play d takes c5. So probable continuation, knight b3, c takes d4, knight b takes d4, knight c6. Developing, pressuring the knight on d4. If knight takes c6, b takes c6, I have compromised my pawns on the queen side, but I've gained an open d file and also a half open b file as well. Maybe my queen can come to b6 in conjunction with knight g4, that would be particularly strong, threatening a checkmate on f2. That's a long-range goal, but it could happen as lines open up here. The main thing, if you're black in this position, you want to strive for uh, a maximum number of open lines. You don't want to sit back and allow white to complete their development, not with them having played king f1 already. Their coordination is screwed up. Their king is temporarily unsafe. We need to exploit that fact. So combative moves like c5, creating pawn tension... Trying to develop quickly, even at the cost of your structure. Those are the things you should be thinking about. And I was tempted to use the e3 weakness right away on the previous move. If I just back up one move here. I was tempted to play knight d5 or knight g4. But for one thing, that would be really obvious what I'm going for. And white was probably going to move this knight anyways to try to get the dark square bishop out. So he could play knight c4 or maybe knight b3 and cover that square. I feel like I'm going to have knight to d5 or knight g4 in the future anyway, so just holding off for a moment is fine. And this is a rare occurrence in my games. I'm actually up almost three minutes on the clock. <laughs> that does not happen in my standard games very often. And I hope this recording is holding up all right. Because after the last one crashed, I had to restart my computer and try to reboot the program. I use the program XSplit for my recordings, which is a good program. I can recommend it. I've been using it for close to two years now with virtually all my videos. I also have OBS, Open Broadcasting Software, but I don't know as much about it as I do XSplit. But occasionally with XSplit, whenever they release software updates, 
things tend to go haywire. And I'm wondering if that's what happened here because it was prompting me to download some stuff. H3, so that covers the G4 square, but does not address the tension on D4. I like to see that move. I think that move is very slow. Now, it also creates another weakness here, so I'm even thinking of knight h5. If I don't want to send the knight towards the e3 square, I do have knight h5 available. Which you know could be helpful if white plays king f2, because then I can take on d4 and my dark square bishop will be opened up along with the queen against the d4 pawn. So now, what order do I play those moves in? If I play knight h5 right away, maybe... They can respond with knight e4 covering, but then I just take. There's also f5 to consider, but even rook takes e4, bishop takes e4, knight g3 check followed by taking on e4 is going to work. <laughs> My opponent is not feeling comfortable about his stonewall quote-unquote attack. So knight h5, if king f2 were taking here, that's clear. And if c takes d4, bishop takes d4, that's just devastation. So knight h5, knight e4, at the very least we have rook takes e4. Again, maybe that f5 move, but I'm a little leery of f5 just because it weakens my king. White could play, <coughs> excuse me, queen b3 check or something like that. Even that I think should be fine for black after king over, but maybe knight g5 threatening knight f7. I'm not going to calculate it any further though because I've already established I have rook takes e4 in that case. I could also just focus on attacking d4 and leave this knight on f6, so I could play knight c6. But I think white's going to respond with that knight b3 move, and it's similar to the variation I mentioned before. But knight h5, not only does it attack d4, but it creates the other threat, so I'm really liking that move. And I think that's the right move order, too. Yeah, let's play this way. If I were to have taken on d4 first... Then white could reply with knight takes. And maybe then on knight h5, they could play something like queen f3. Although even there, bishop takes d4 is probably good. But I think I like this move order best. Already difficult to see how white defends. If bishop b5 attacking my rook, I can just follow through with knight to g3 check. I guess they could play king g1 then, though, couldn't they? Knight takes h1, bishop takes e8. Mm -hmm. So maybe on bishop b5, I'm just best served by playing bishop to d7 and offering a trade of the bishops. Bishop takes d7, let's say queen takes. I still have my threat. Also, white cannot play knight e4 anymore. Their bishop would not be protecting that square. And I'm still on the d4 pawn as well. So yeah, that's probably the way to go. White might have to start thinking about drastic stuff like king f2, c takes d4, pawn c4. Admitting that they're down a pawn and just trying to stabilize the position. Close lines. It's not pretty, but that's what I would think about doing as white. Yeah, and he might be onto that. So taking on d4, taking with the bishop, of course, does not make sense due to pawn takes. There is knight f4, but knight f4, he can play bishop b5. Taking must be correct, so let's just play it fast. Keep the pressure on him. So we're going to be up a pawn and up on time, and we possess the initiative. So all signs are pointing to... A promising game for us going forward. Already a promising game. If c4, knight c6 is my natural move, but also knight f4 looks pretty good. If I want to harass that light square bishop. It's even possible to try bishop f6 going to h4 with check. 
or maybe make a queen move like queen to d6 trying to use the g3 square. Somehow I don't think those plans are going to truly test white's position though. I think it makes more sense to go after d3 or just develop my queen side. He plays knight e4. Mm -hmm. So allowing me to take on c3, which I probably should. No threats that white has. Yeah, let's grab this pawn. If something like bishop g5, I have queen b6 check. And b2 is still under attack. So I'm anticipating b takes c3. And then maybe bishop f5, attack the knight. And the knight is defending the pawn on c3, so it's not out of the question that I might take the knight at some point, even if white's defending it a few times, and then take on c3 with my bishop. Okay, but my opponent plays this move, so I thought this was just bad in view of queen b6 check. But let's double check. So queen b6 check, bishop e3, queen takes b2 check. White has to block somehow. If they offer a queen trade, I'm going to be up, what, three pawns already? So maybe bishop back to c2 there, but even if I don't have rook takes e4 in that instance, I'm sure there are other moves that are good. Rook takes e4, I'm thinking they might check down here or maybe chase my queen. Yeah, I can't be scared of that line. I don't think that's going to work for him. Now with his king on the second rank. Another move I could think about is f6, but that's really ugly. I don't want to block my dark square bishop in. Yeah, I think best to just deliver this check. If king back to f1, then rook takes e4 is looking really nice. In addition to c takes b2. But let's say king f1, rook takes e4, bishop takes e4, knight g3 check. White cannot go to g1 or f2 because of my queen. So they'd have to go to e1. I can take on e4. I picked up two minor pieces for the rook. Also, d8 is covered by my queen. We can insert c takes b2 whenever we want. We're just having a field day. So I think Nimzo Bros will probably play bishop e3, and then I'll take on b2 a check. And it should just be too much material, in addition to the damage to white's king. Not much else to think about. King e2 or king e1 right now are suicidal with the rook on e8. So I think it's bishop e3 or king f1, but both moves have deficiencies. Yeah, bishop e3. On the one hand, it would be nice to keep the queens on board. After So upon taking this pawn, I'm anticipating that I'll block with the queen. It would be nice to keep the queens on board, but three pawns is three pawns, right? I mean, that's equivalent to a minor piece in terms of material. So I've done enough to win the game at this point, and I can just look forward to bringing my pieces into the fray now. Now, how best to trade? Because I do not have to take here right away. It might be more annoying for white if I just leave my queen on b2, so that if he does take it, I get that pawn advanced even further, protected by the bishop. So maybe I should make a move like bishop f5 right now. Bishop f5 attacks the knight. If knight d6, I have bishop takes d3, and I'm on the queen again. He cannot play queen takes d3 because he's pinned along the second rank, remember? So I think this is pretty darn tempting. If bishop f5, queen takes b2, c takes b2, he's got to take a moment to defend the rook, and that doesn't bode well for him when he has the knight on e4 also to worry about. I do put myself um, in danger of a g4 move forking the bishop and the knight. But since bishop f5 is coming with tempo against the knight, I don't think we have to be concerned. So it's been working all game, developing aggressively with a gain of time, so let's keep doing it.
a time-honored chess strategy. Not just this game, but anytime you can develop your pieces and also gain time, you're usually on the right track. That's playing with the initiative 101. He could try to defend this knight by playing knight f to g5, but then his knights are very precariously placed. h6, trying to kick the knight away, kind of makes um, his house of cards look like it's about to, f to fall down. So I don't anticipate that working for him. Knight c5, moving the knight away, will just lose to queen takes c2, followed by bishop takes c2. Or even knight c5, bishop takes d3 is working as well. If I were white, I'd probably try knight g5, just because, but it's not fun. It is worth saying, though, if you're in an objectively losing position, and you know it's losing, you should strive to make the position as complicated as possible. Go a little crazy. Make it messy. Because a loss is a loss, right? I mean, you don't get any points for how you lose. I think some people want to lose in a clean way. They feel like if they can just stay close in material count, you know, even if they go down, at least it's okay that I was only down a pawn or two the whole way. Uh, they're satisfied with that. But really the way you should be thinking is if you're down, you should go into guerrilla warfare mode. You should ask yourself, what is the most awkward thing I can do for my opponent in converting that position to a win? Like what will give them the most grief in trying to get the full point out of this position and play that way? If you're down, let's say in this case, like three points of material, who cares if you're down five points of material? You're probably going to lose anyways. But if five points of material allows you to complicate the game to an extent where your opponent has to sweat a little bit and find some tough moves, that's probably worth it. I'd rather be down five points of material in a very messy position versus being down two points of material in a just a technically sound position for my opponent where I have absolutely no counterplay and I'm just getting ground down. This is something I mentioned before in videos, but it bears repeating. So he's running out of time, too. The opening just didn't go right for him, Nimzo Bros. I think if you're going to play this reverse stonewall, you got to be uh, pretty accurate in how you set it up. And especially if black is trying to explode the center with d6 and e5 like that, or d6 and c5 to a lesser extent, you got to be careful because that's a direct challenge to those pawns on f4 and d4. <laughs> Nimzo Bros is... Oh, this page has become unresponsive. Wait. I just got a message. I don't know if you guys could see that pop up, that Lee Chess was becoming unresponsive. That makes me really nervous because that's exactly what was happening uh, in that previous video. Uh-oh. I'm going to refresh this page. I think it's... Oh no. I'm trying to reload the page, but I don't know what's happening. Uh oh. I do not know what to do. I'm going to reload and try to go back in. Oh, he played knight f6 check. Okay. Well, in that case, something really weird is happening. What is going on with my screen now? <laughs> Are you guys seeing this? Okay, knight f6 check was played. I can barely see the pieces, but I'm going to play a move anyways. I think I'm just going to take with my knight. Because there's nothing wrong with that, right? Oh, there we go. Okay, the lights have been turned on again. <laughs> oh, this makes me so nervous. i got to figure out what's up with my computer. So bishop takes or knight takes. Let's collect ourselves here. Probably knight takes. It's fine. Both moves completely win. But let's just play knight takes because it gets us out of any g4 potential threats. It's a more har harmonious move too. 
Yeah, he played his next move quick, but now he's just down a piece and those three pawns from before. Well, I want to say disaster averted, but the game is still going, so I'm not going to say anything yet until this game is over. So now he's threatening the b2 pawn. I want to defend that, so probably probably knight d5 makes sense. He could play bishop d4, though. Maybe I can just make a developing move, knight c6, because if he goes here, I have this nice move, rook takes e3. And then if king takes e3, knight d5 check, and I'm on the rook on b2. Let's do that. That's kind of clever. And it also gets our remaining minor piece into the game and connects our rooks. Yeah, he's going to allow us to carry out this idea. And he resigns. Knight c6 was also helpful because it controlled the d4 square, so he couldn't put his bishop here. We would just take it. So, let's tell him good game, and what's to be said about this game? I think I already kind of summarized my thoughts, but I think white just can't really afford to play... Well, they might be able to get away with f4. I'm not sure about that move in view of e5, but white has to be extremely careful after this. The game continuation was not sufficient for white, because the position just opened up. After king f1, white's already clearly worse, I feel. So maybe they could play this way if they were to play a move like knight e2. But that's not in the spirit of the stonewall either. You do want the knight on f3 where it can influence the center. So I can understand his desire to continue playing in the fashion he's used to in this opening. So if I were white, I would probably play knight f3 directly and forget about putting the pawn on f4. But if he's accustomed to playing this setup this way, then... Uh, it makes sense the way he did it, f4 followed by knight g, f3. I think after I played c5, white can ill afford to play h3. That might be almost a losing move after knight h5. White has to have a, a serious sense of, sense of urgency right now. He's got to get his pieces into play. I think he has to focus on getting this dark square bishop out and somehow getting his king to safety in the next, I don't know, 5, 10 moves at the most. So a move like h3... I know he's worried about knight g4, but if I, w if I really wanted to play knight g4, I would have played it on the previous move, or knight d5 for that matter. That's kind of why, incidentally, I like holding off on really obvious threats. Like in this position, he knows that the e3 square is weak, and that's why he played h3, denying me this. Maybe he was trying to deny bishop g4, but probably it was knight g4. So both of us are aware that e3 is weak and that I can attack that with a move like knight coming into one of these squares. But holding off is kind of nice because you still... You create some doubt in your opponent's head about when I'm, you're going to play that. And you're just making a useful move on another region of the board. So in this case, in the center, creating some tension between the c5 and the d4 pawns. Yeah, and I think after this, c takes d4. He probably has to play c4 and shut down the position. Close some lines. It's not pretty, but after knight e4 takes, and especially bishop g5, uh, it's too much. He was losing three pawns. Maybe his last chance was B takes C3. Still doesn't look very nice, but he's fighting. Let's click over to the analysis board. Yeah, something is clearly wrong with my computer. <laughs> I don't think this is a Lee Chess issue. It's either my computer or my internet connection or both. Okay. So just for reference, let me flip the board for a moment. I want to show you the setup that he was going for uh, with white because it's called the, the reverse stonewall. And to know why that's the case, you have to see it from the black side. So the stonewall variation is a line that typically arises out of the Dutch defense. Well, it always arises out of the Dutch defense. But it basically entails black setting up a bunch of pawns on light squares. So they play a pawn arrangement like this, where they control the e4 square really well. 
And then they usually plant a bishop on d6, which kind of shores up some of the dark squares, which become weak because you have so many pawns on light squares. So this creates problems on the dark squares for black. Black has to be very cautious about trading these dark square bishops. But they do have such influence on the light squares and control of the center that this is a notoriously difficult setup to crack from the white side. I recall losing a game on the white side of this setup against international master, now grandmaster elect, Priya Darshan Kanapin. Uh, back in the fall in the U.S. Chess League. So I can attest that this is a, a real stodgy, sturdy setup. So what White was trying to do in this game was basically aim for that with colors reversed. Which you can play this way. I mean, this is I've seen good players play this way. There's a guy, international master Yakov Norowitz, who's from New Jersey. And he plays this system constantly, or at least he did several years ago. I think he's branched out into more mainstream D4 openings. But he was a big fan of this line for a while. And it just so happened, because I chose g6 and bishop g7, that I had a lot of options against his arrangement of pawns. If I were to have played my customary d5, and he were to go after this same sort of setup, let's say something like this, well, now I've already committed this pawn here, so I'm not going to have as much punch in the center. Arranging e5 is going to be tremendously difficult. So let's say I play, let's say I play something like c5 against this. Uh, then I think white can uh, pull off this setup a little more easily. Black certainly has counter-arguments against this, but he will control the e5 square very well. So it's kind of a stroke of luck that he chose this setup against my flank arrangement with g6, bishop g7, knight f6, and I hadn't moved the d or the e pawn. So when I saw that he was going for this reverse stonewall, I decided, you know what, I'm going to prepare the pawn break in the center because based on my experience, this is one of the best things to do. So here, d6. And as I mentioned, I think knight f3 should be played, and it does seem like the computer agrees, or even e4 here, which is not a move a, a reverse stonewall player would probably make most of the time, moving the e pawn again. But I bet f4 is a bit risky. You can see this eval already starts to creep in black's favor. Yeah, e5. Open lines in the middle. So had he played knight f3... I probably would have played either c5 directly or maybe knight bd7. I could see myself going for an arrangement like like this, perhaps, and then putting the bishop on b7, double fee and kettowing, leaving the e-pawn back home. I could still go for e5 if I wanted. I mean, I could still play this way, too. So I would have considered that, followed by rook e8, and try to threaten the e4 fork on the knight and the bishop. But I would have been more inclined to go for c5. But after f4, definitely e5 to create maximum tension between these pawns. His king is in the center, at least two moves away from castling. Ours is nicely tucked away, so you've got to open lines. Let's try to exploit our advantage right now. So f takes e, take here, knight f3, take. Again, if he takes here, not only does that destroy his structure, but also the bishop on d3 is hanging. So not attractive for white. Knight f3, I'm just chopping. And this is a tough call, which way to recapture for white. And let's look at all of them. Knight takes d4, just loses a piece after c5. The knight has to move away, and then we take the bishop. c takes d4 creates this really ugly backward pawn on e3. Is that a backward pawn? Just kind of a weak pawn, I suppose. But I would have played rook e8 attacking it immediately. And it does stick out like a sore thumb. It's, it's not a nice weakness to have to defend. And it'll prevent white from castling so early. Still, though, that might be the safer option, right? Because after e takes d4 as played, we get this check in. And it seems like almost every reply white has to this check has some sort of drawback. So probably they should play c takes d4. Might be your best shot, Nimzo bros. Rook e8 and then a knight move to defend the pawn on e3. So e takes d4, rook e8 check. And now what to do? I didn't play queen e7, just to remind you, because of queen e2. After rook e8, queen e2 is impossible, because we just take the queen. But here, this is a viable option for them, trying to swap pieces off the board. If bishop e2, I was going to play queen e7, most likely. So trying to stop white from castling because of the hanging bishop on e2. That's going to slow him down. Knight e5 I didn't really think about. 
Yeah, I would have just developed and attacked the knight, maybe knight g4, but knight c6 is a developing move with tempo. You can try to support it, but it looks really, really shaky. Even if I just continue capturing, right, like hammering his knight, knight g4, I feel like I'm just going to win a pawn soon. White's best bet is to castle yeah, and go down a pawn. Not good. So it's already choosing between a bunch of evils at this point. Kind of like our presidential election. I don't know what I would do here if I were white. So king f1. Certainly white does not want to play king f2 because of knight g4 check. So if he is going to move the king, king f1 is safer. And now I played c5 because I feel like I, I don't quite have enough to win just in the center or on the king side. I haven't weakened his position to that extent. But creating tension elsewhere and challenging the figurehead of white's formation, which is that d4 pawn, makes a lot of sense. So c5 does appear to be good. And it goes along with that philosophy I mentioned about not playing the obvious move right away. If you don't see a move like knight g4 or knight d5 leading anywhere, don't play it immediately. Just hold off on it for a bit. So c5, yeah, I think white has to play knight b3 and reinforce that pawn. And then I was considering taking, and after knight b takes d4, playing knight c6. Good. The computer is approving of these moves. That makes me happy. Because, again, I'm not that concerned about structure. I know I have isolated pawns now in the event of this line. But I'm opening the position to my advantage. The queen gets access to b6. White's king is still a big question mark. We're developing rapidly. We're getting more pieces out. If this bishop moves and the queen moves, maybe I can get my rook over to d8. All pieces are participating in the assault. So I'm looking to exploit my advantage ASAP. I'm not messing around. And even a tempo can matter big time in these positions, especially for white. And that's why they can't afford to play h3, I don't believe. Yeah, the computer thinks that's almost the losing move. It's already close to minus 2, but this puts it at almost minus 3. So I played knight h5. A little bit of a change of plans, but now that the g3 square is weak, knight h5 makes sense. The engine also wants to do this, and then what? Knight c6? Yeah, that's also a pretty attractive looking line. Just attacking in the center and developing again. But it seems like knight h5 is good. I don't see why it wouldn't be. And best, according to the computer, is knight b3, allowing black to go ahead and win the exchange. Mm, yeah, that's telling. The computer is saying white's position is so dire that they just got to give up an exchange and try to complete their development and stumble on. For a human, that's harder to do. You're probably going to want to defend against the knight g3 threat like Nimzo Bros did. So king f2, we take on d4. We've got two defenders. And white only has two attackers right now. So white would lose a pawn if they took on d4 first. Hmm. Knight e4 is actually the best move. I thought c4 might be sl a slightly better try, trying to make me keep this pawn on d4, but still pretty bad. Knight f4, attacking the bishop makes sense. Just knight c6 also makes sense, developing. Maybe rook into e3 if I get really frisky. So knight e4, I take on c3. Ah, uh, bishop f5, yeah, I guess I should have considered that move as well, attacking the knight. I was just happy to take on c3. I knew my bishop was really powerful here. So I didn't see any reason not to. And he was taking a lot of time. So I wanted to keep the pressure on. And here b takes c3 does seem like the only chance. And just playing the position of pawn down. And then bishop f5 is good. Attacking the knight. Okay. One problem for white here is that rook e1. Trying to kind of castle by hand. I think would just run into bishop takes e4. And if bishop takes, queen takes... Then I can take on... No, that's not letting me play that move. There we go. I can take on e4. Unless he has a check here. Maybe he does have rook d8 check at the very end. And then bishop a3. Hmm, that would be a reversal. Attacking that pin piece. Okay, so I, it's not that easy if rook e1. I might just want to make a developing move. So he still has life after b takes c3. I don't see a slam dunk win. But bishop g5, on the other hand, queen b6 check, and I'm pretty sure this is going to be clear cut. Queen c2, not many other good options. 
Bishop c2 would have posed me an interesting question whether I want to take on e4. Because I could, and the bishop is pinned. But I was a little worried about stuff like rook b1 or queen d8 check. So I might have even played a sensible move after bishop c2, like bishop f5, I think would be pretty good too. Develop and attack the knight. And also the bishop behind it. Yeah, anytime I can't make a move, it says, it says uh, reconnecting up at the top. So there's something going on with my connection. So white block with the queen. Yeah, moving to king is no no um, improvement either. Just to illustrate, like if king g1, let's say, c2 is going to work. Attacking the queen, also opening up the queen and bishop against the rook on a1. Crushing. So queen c2. Now I just played a calm developing move, bishop f5. If knight to d6, trying to attack the bishop and the rook. I was just going to play bishop takes d3. And this queen is pinned. So nothing doing for white. Queen takes b2, c takes b2, knight takes e8, take on a1. Black is up way too much material. So he played knight f6, and this is where I almost had a heart attack because uh, the board was not responding. But <laughs> fortunately, the game was over in a few more moves. Okay, so I hope this game gives you a good kind of roadmap against how to play, uh, how to play against this reverse stonewall. I think I showed using this e5 pawn break how you can try to tear down the stone wall immediately before your opponent even gets developed. But the complicating factor is if you play like d4, d5 and they go into it, you're not going to have uh, as great an opportunity to just take them to task in the center right away. But if you play knight f6 on move 1, you can still go for this setup because you haven't moved uh, your d-pawn. So this is one of the most effective ways to combat this line. And also, I think this game shows the value of a single tempo and how when you're getting attacked, you can't afford to play kind of slower moves, like uh, especially h3 stands out for white. Like that's not a move you can get away with when you're under that much pressure. But it's tough. I mean, I can understand why Nimzo Bros made that mistake because when you're under pressure, that can often lead to more mistakes very quickly. One other thing too is exploiting your initiative and playing on all areas of the board. So like the c5 move, I'm trying to create tension in the center, too. I'm not just looking at trying to land a knight on e3. I'm not getting blinders on. I'm trying to create white maximum problems. And that line I mentioned, even though it didn't happen in the game, of the trade on d4 followed by knight c6, playing at the expense of pawn structure, playing for the initiative, trying to create threats to keep our opponent on our back foot. That's how I would have proceeded if white had defended better. Anyways, I'm going to kill this video before something crashes. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll be back again soon with another one. Talk to you guys later. Bye.